Please welcome Dave Maddox, everyone. Hello, Mr. De Christopher, and hello, <laughs> hello, viewers and listeners everywhere. Yes, around the world on this. Uh, Dave and I were just speaking off offline, off camera, and uh, we're both in different parts of Massachusetts. You're probably about the same distance north of Boston that I. You're about thirty miles north of Boston. No, it's it's it's. Uh, I think it's about fifteen or sixteen, John. Fif okay, we're on the on the north shore. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and, and, you, and you're 30, 30 where you I'm are? Down 30 there? miles. Yeah. Well, I'm 30 miles south of my, 35 south of my mom who's in Melrose. So I'm probably 25 south of okay. Boston. Okay. Yeah. Right. I know and it was a big cohesive. trek. I know I realized and I appreciated it was a big trek for you when you came up to my birthday party a couple of, the big birthday party a couple of that years was, ago, all the way up to uh, Beverly. That was a that was a trek for you, but thank you for, for doing that, man. It was great. Of course, thank you. Great thank to see you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, that was so much fun. Well, that you know, and I can't believe that was three years ago. Coming up next really, month, really, right? Yeah, who'd have thought? I'm, 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 I'm coming up for forty-three, John. <laughs> yes, and you look fabulous for forty-three. I'd have guessed 38, 37, 38. Well, you look pretty good yourself, John. <laughs> should, should we get a room? <laughs> uh, I thought. I thought it was going to be a hoot with Greg Bissonette last week, but I can see we're already <laughs> off to a great start. <laughs> oh yeah, and we've got a, we've got a lot of folks watching too, which is great. So cool, good to see everybody. Um, and Dave and I were just saying that we're getting some snow here today, and he's getting snow. He's up along the the coast in beautiful Marblehead, Massachusetts. I'm down in the South Shore in Cohasset, Mass, and uh, and I was thinking. They were, the weather forecasters would be wrong again, and this would all be rain, but we're getting like a pretty good amount of snow falling right now. So we'll see. We dodged yeah. the bullet on the last one. Um, yeah. We hardly got anything the last time it came through a few days ago. And then about 15 miles west of us, I, I heard stories of a foot and more. Foot, couple of foot, you know. It was yeah, kind of yeah. We were lucky. I think it's the same for you, isn't it? You, not too bad for you. Nothing, nothing it's really. Weird, at all on the yeah. last one, I know. And and my son who lives in in Drake at Mass, which is just kind of south of New Hampshire. We were there yesterday, in fact, to visit the grandkids, and uh, they they got like 19 inches or something total, or, or in some parts of the town, he definitely had over a foot in his at his house. So. Yeah, it took, it's me, funny it took, me, it took me some time to get used to it over here when moved. I mean, it's been 20 plus years we've been here. And, you know, obviously we'd get the weather would be extreme in the UK, but not not the extremities that you get here in New England. But it took us a while to get used to it. But yeah, it is what it is. When did you move? Was it was it like around? Was it the late 90s or early 2000s? It was 2000. It 2000. was it was there was a there was a period where we were both going backwards and forwards and I was working here a lot, but I think the actual move was at the front end of 2000, I believe. Wow. Okay. So 20, yeah, yeah over 20 years. Wow. wow. I remember. Yeah. I, I, I remember when, um, when you made the move and, 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 and you'd looked in a few different spots, if I remember correctly, right? I mean, had you looked, had you looked in the South shore at one point too? Of no, Boston? no, 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 you... I didn't look in the South shore that um, I, I'd looked around various options in, in the in the US. Yeah. And yeah. as much as I liked um, other places, New York was just too a little too crazy for me. Yeah. Nashville musically was good, but uh, uh, let's just say on a on another level more akin to kind of politics and lifestyle, that wasn't going to be a good fit. And and, and LA the West Coast just felt, I mean, it's great. All these places are, are, are fantastic, but I, I, I would have felt an element of fish out of water. Mm -hmm. And I'd always liked New England. And uh, sure. cut a long story short, which I think you and I may have talked about this before, John. Long story short, I met um, a handful of people based in Boston. Um, great friend, Tom Doobie, who used to do sound for uh, Richard Thompson. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Duke Levine, who's famous guitarist in these parts and wider, and we yeah, were work ended yeah. up working together in Mary Chapin's band. And he introduced me to a, 
a film composer here in Marblehead by the name of Mason Daring, and one thing led to another, and blah blah blah, and that's how we ended up in in, in Marblehead. Yeah. Ah, okay. I never heard that story, but that makes oh, perfect okay. sense. And, yeah. yeah, and I could see, you know, I mean, the, the I've I've always loved the. Um, you know the par the parallels, for lack of a better word, of of New England and England, and so much of of what you guys did in England was based on what we did here in Massachusetts, and we appreciate that. That it's you know you named a lot of towns after Mass. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> it's like the old joke about how they built how they built um, Windsor Castle close to Heathrow why Airport. Did, why did they put it so close to the airport? It's it's a mystery, yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> but um, no, but it, I, I could see that it would, of, of all the different places you yeah. mentioned, it would feel more like home. Um, that it was that, that it, it, yes, uh, and geographically like easy to get to anywhere, yeah. whether it be Nashville, LA, or going back to England and, uh, and on a cultural kind of political, just the way the place leans. And the yes, other big yeah. thing, John, I, I, on a musical front was that I liked, I, I didn't, I felt that I'd done, I don't like using the word compete because that's that's not appropriate, but I felt that I'd done the thing if, if it was in London. And at that mm -hmm. stage in my life, it was like, okay, I, I want to take a step back. I don't want to, I don't want to be kind of, getting in there and hustle, you know I just want to go somewhere where there's a where there's a good music scene and yeah, yeah. one of the many things that appealed to me about this part of the world was the the obviously it's got a pretty strong singer songwriter thing going on which is my comfort zone and that's my that's become my my thing I suppose um but there's a blues scene and there's a jazz scene and you know there's a rock scene and blah 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 whereas other uh, I guess this is a way too much of an over exaggeration, but Nashville, for example, I don't know what chances, if it, not too much, I would imagine there are to play any kind of jazz down there. Yeah, and I, yeah. I, I'm sure there are. I just don't know of them. But it, it, I like the fact that this was more of a kind of a, a, a hodgepodge of, of things. Plus, as I say, the singer songwriter thing was um, that was a, an essential thing to me. I remember saying to yeah. my friend Tom yeah. Doobie. Um, as I said, he, he was doing sound for, uh, he, I first met him when he did sound for um, Richard Thompson and things were kind of, you know, really tailing off in the UK and I was working with Richard and working with Chapin and I, and I said something one day to him along the lines of, do you know any singer songwriters that would be interested in an old folk, folk drummer? doing some sessions and he said uh, yeah I might be able to find one or two that and, and that led to me kind yeah. of and that meeting Duke Levine and some other people around Boston people around that time led to me kind of starting to work over in in New England I, I feel like when you got here you hit the ground running I couldn't believe and I, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have been surprised but but the fact that you came from London and you know, and, and you just, I, I just remember you were like, you'd come to visit us at Zildjian or we'd talk on the phone and you'd say, well, if, you, if you're not doing anything, I'm, I'm gigging this week at this place and I'm doing, you know, and it was just like, wow, you, you got like right um, into, immersed into the scene, like instantly. It's, and you were still touring with Mary Chapin Carpenter at that point too, were you still? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah either so. her or Richard or. Or uh, Richard Thompson, or, yeah. Or Richard, yeah. But, but, but the other thing that was, I know this is a bit of a cliche, but it always felt to me that there was enough room because what I didn't, the last thing it's, I mean, you know me, you, you do know me well enough to know that it, it wasn't the, the worst thing that, that, that anybody can do in, in a situation like this is to come into town and go, hey, I'm here, watch out yeah. guys, stand yeah. aside. <laughs> there was enough, I hate that kind of thing. There was, in, yeah. there seemed to be enough room for everybody and, uh, and all, all the dramas of, of, of the, 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 you know, my peers here in, in New England, they've all, most, nearly all of them have become friends. And I don't feel that I've done anybody out of a gig or anything. There's, no. there's room. I mean, I know it's not what it was 20 years ago, that, that, and especially obviously with COVID. I mean, well, it's just dead, but it, it, it felt like there was room. Yeah. And the Berkeley, the Berkeley thing as well. And, exactly, yeah. Yeah, and you've got a great question. I'm going to jump backwards here from Anthony Cusina, who I can always count on. He comes to all these 
um, live from the drum room chat and he's always always has some great questions. So he's asking you, Dave. Yeah. Um, hello, Dave. Would you please talk about some things that you're working on these days to improve your playing? Some great question. Okay. Um, I'm trying. Hi, it, Kelly. Yeah, I, I'm trying. I'm trying to, despite COVID, I'm trying just to keep playing as much as possible. I'm actually working, if I'm honest, I'm, wor <laughs> I'm working on my keyboard skills more than I am my drumming these days. I've Ooh. always played, I've always played keyboards and I'm, I'm just trying to kind of get better on that and, and improve my harmonic knowledge. That's arguably taking up a little bit more of my time than sitting down and, and, and working things out. Um, I don't really have, m this is not false modesty, I don't, compared to what's going on around out there, I don't have much facility on the kit, but what I have is a reasonable sense of t time. Uh, my time is kind of okay. Um, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's um, okay. <laughs> it's, well, you know, it is, it's a guy, I, I'm, I'm no Jack Bruno, let me put it that way. Now there's a guy with some, with a great, a great time, great film. But in answer to your question, it's, it's, I'm just trying to play as much as I possibly can. 99.9% um, .9 of the time it's with a click. And as I was explaining to a student just the other day, um, if you're going to practice whatever, whatever you're going to practice with a click, when you get down to the slower tempos, it's really important. And this is a very subjective point of view. Mm -hmm. It's really important to have your click subdivide that, that you're going to play to. When yeah. you start practicing things around this kind of tempo, you might think, especially if you start playing kind of patterns, that, for example, you know, hypothetical 16th notes, things in them, you might think you're on the money. But if you dial in some subdivisions to your click so that it goes and then you start playing you're going to know a lot yeah. you're going to be it's going to become a lot clearer to you where those beats are falling so so my suggestion to whatever it is you're going to work whatever it is you happen to be working on or you wish to pursue is that when you do practice, try to subdivide. If you've got an app or a metronome mm -hmm. or whatever it is you've got, um, I recommend that you you subdivide, subdivide that metronome because there's a world, <laughs> as you and I know, John. There's a world inside those quarter notes. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great advice, and I and I I should follow that. I I don't when I when I play to the click, it's it's usually just you know in note to note, beat to beat. Um, well, what's interesting but, about I've had conversations like Mover and I have talked about this and he can't bear that. Jonathan Mover can't bear it. And he wants that call to note click. Yeah. And to me, yeah. that's like, it's like a spike in the ear. I want that. Uh, 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 or if it's triplet based, but do that and do that and do that, whatever it might be. But but so it's very subjective. You know, that's what I suggest. Yeah, yeah. So it's not like you have to do It's like the. John, it's like yeah. the freaking thing holding the stick. You have to do it this way. You have to do it. You know, I don't care it if makes, you stick it underneath your armpit as long as you get a good sound. You know. But but knowing you're playing, it makes sense because there's there you can leave you leave so much space between notes at times when you're playing, and that makes sense that you're 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 hearing it. You're hearing these notes with all that space in between, that maybe a lot of us aren't hearing. We're just hearing quarter notes. You know, and it's just, I'm going to, it's there and then it's there and then it's there, but you're hearing all these other things in between it. And that sometimes, yeah. 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 I think I, I, I got asked about it once and I, I said, it's almost, it's almost like telegraph poles with a gap between them. Mm -hmm. And if you just think one, two, three, four, etc that's kind of one way but if you think about some kind of arc between them one two three four if you think of some something that that rolls a circular thing that goes between those quarter notes you're gonna have an increased awareness of the space between those notes right. even when the tempo starts to to get up into the 
into the nosebleed territory when it's mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah but, but yeah but if, you know what man you know I, the, the older i get the more i realize that everyone's got a different way of dealing with it and it's not there's no <laughs> there's no real right or wrong way there, there, yeah. there, there really yeah. isn't it's just what works for you but uh, i have made that suggestion about about subdividing a click to students when they when i feel that their placement it is 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 not on the money and i always add to that by saying i'm not trying to turn you into a drum machine you know i this is where we get into the the nitty gritty about time here's here's something which i think may be of interest and may be amusing to mm. not only you but people listening to this so this is my theory chris my, my chris my theory my theory <laughs> is that there's guys and gals with really really great time who make thing make things feel really really great there's also people with fantastic time and it sounds like a drum machine mm -hmm. yeah there's also people whose time isn't maybe that exact but it feels absolutely fantastic when they play with a band their band or in another mm -hmm. situation and then there's people whose time isn't very good and they kind of suck <laughs> That's me in the last, I'm in the last category. I don't think you are in the last <laughs> category, but you know what I mean about those four, about those four things? Yes. I think I'm somewhere between, I'm somewhere between four and three myself. You know, my time is kind of okay and I'm trying to make things feel good. But there's some people, their time is absolutely fantastic and they make things feel really good. And there's other people, and obviously I'm not going to be drawn on names because it's a subjective thing anyway right. whose 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 time is is just spot on but it just sounds like a machine mm -hmm. i don't hear paul yeah. clavis who you know yes. well is one of my heroes i was playing him something that fell into that second category i won't say who it was and, and we, we were we were talking about the technical aspect of it and mm -hmm. it was unbelievably brilliant and Paul who as I say he's, he's a hero of mine I, I I think the guy's a friggin genius I mean he's just such a great musician yeah and we li he listened to it John for a while and John and he go, he looks at me and he goes where's the sex yeah 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 and yeah. that's now the, the person who asked the question to start with that's something that i have been working on ever since i came here i've been trying to get i know i've said this before so uh, my apologies to to for those who've heard me say this before i'm trying to get some grease into my playing i'm still trying to retain some element of being able to play in time but I'm trying to get just to get some grease in where, where appropriate. Sometimes it's not it's they don't want it. They want it kind of, you know, but yeah. I'm trying to get I mean, it's most exemplified by the thing that you and I have talked about. And, and that most people these days know about it was it was a little bit of a mystery kind of 30 years ago. These days, everybody knows about it. And that's that thing where where things aren't straight eighths and they're not and they're not dotted either. They're in right. the cracks. Yes. That's that territory. I started to discover that about 30 years ago. I came to it late. I hear guys now kind of in their twenties and thirties who've got that, that kind of shit down. And that's, that's great. Um, oh, God, he's a fantastic drummer who played in NRBQ. He's not with us anymore. Oh, Tommy Artelino. Tommy. Oh my <clears throat> God. Tommy had that shit down so good. It's just yeah. not true that's yep. that's what i that's my if there's an area i'm trying to put, put, pursue these days it's that and that thinking and that for that kind of without getting too arty farty about it that musical kind of philosophy also goes over it it's not just kind of rock it's that's a jazz thing as well mm -hmm. and once exactly. you yeah. once you become aware of that that thinking where things can be not 
nailed down, so to speak, it's it's opened up a whole world for me. I mean, it, well, this is like 30 years ago. I'm still trying to get a handle on it. But wow, no, that's that's cool. That's that's good. I, you know, I I know what you're saying, and I I guess I wouldn't describe your playing as as having. I I think there is some grease to it already, but I wouldn't I wouldn't describe it. As, you're just not that kind of a player. When I think of you as a as a uh, definitely a feel player. Um, but a very clean field player. Like Jeff Picaro, I, I think he had a lot of grease, but he also was just really clean too. Do you know what I mean? Like like his, when you listen to like some of the stuff he played was just, the backbeat was was there. There wasn't, it was just clean, but it had this incredible Execution. feel to it. Execution. Execution. And, and, I, and I hear that in, in the way you play as well. It's, 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 it, it definitely has feel to it. I mean, it's not a mechanical, um, and, the, and the, you're a great example of one of those guys that Adam Nussbaum says, yay cats, truth. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Adam. And Ralph Salmons is, is watching as well. Wow, we get some great oh. guys watching. Hey, great guys hey Ralph, guys. Adam, great, great guys, hi. Yeah, um, but you know, like a great example of, of one of those guys that, I'll hear you on a record and it's, you'd be the first to say it's a simple beat. It's maybe eighth notes in the hi-hat and, you know, two and four in the snare drum and then trying to play that and have it feel that way, even sound the same. It's, it, it's, it's, for me, it's undoable. It's just, it's, it, it's one of those things where you're playing it on the dashboard of your car while you're driving, if it's on the radio and you're like, yeah, I got this shit down, you know, and then you get behind the kit and it's like, whoa, whoa, did somebody put cinder blocks, you know, around my arms? <laughs> one of my, one of my, one of my, um, <laughs> one of my drum friends was saying about how he'd shown the, 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 the whole thing about just kind of trying to be, not so much just simple, but, but just kind of solid and straightforward to one of his students. And, 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 and the student had come back and said, that's, that's, that's friggin' boring. And I wrote back and went, I said, dot, 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 <laughs> do you want fries with that? <laughs> oh. It was John, John Medeiros, I think it was. He said, can I, can I use that the next time someone says that to me? <laughs> oh, there's some, well, you and I, I think we're trying to, we're trying to fix the world of face, the Facebook drummer uh, page one drummer at a time, you know, <laughs> for those of you who, who don't go in the Facebook drummer group, Dave and, and Yard too, also. Oh, we're, yeah. <clears throat> we're, he we're comes out there. with some crackers, he does. He comes oh, out he does. with some yeah. fantastic yeah. ones. Yard has no mercy. He just, you know, you and I try to be a little bit, maybe more diplomatic or delicate, but Yard will just come right out and say, you know, what are you wasting your time for, you knucklehead, you know, like... <laughs> It's, as uh, as my friend Simon Nichols says, Yard has always the all the panache of a collapsing greenhouse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 some funny stuff. Oh, that is some. Let me see if there's any other questions. We'll we'll go on. You know, I actually made a few notes too because. Uh oh. Yeah, I hope that's all right. I just, just <laughs> but this is great. I mean, I I probably don't even need it because I I knew that we would just. Um, immediately jump in and, and just have a great conversation, which this is, this is so much fun. And, and uh, but a couple of things I didn't want to, you know, leave out of the conversation. Okay. And I don't know that I ever asked you, and this is like the, this is the, the classic uh, question people ask, but how old were you when you started playing? Were you like Drunk. really young? Were you 12? Well, okay. The piano, okay. I'll, 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 so everybody doesn't fall into a deep coma. I'll give you the, the short version. Uh, apparently, I sat down at a at a piano when I was six and started playing, just started okay. playing tunes and songs. I could hear things and started playing. That went so far, and then drum. The first drum. Well, it wasn't a drum kit. It was a pair of bongos and knitting needles. And I think I was about twelve or thirteen. The kit first kit was about fourteen, fifteen. Had some lessons with a great teacher in England who kind of got me up. The basics, the basic, the real basics of reading, um, mm -hmm. taught me 
taught me the essentials of uh, 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 basic, very basic rudiments, but also, um, which led me to my first professional job, showed me how to play velitas and foxtrots and waltzes, you know, all things yeah. which these days would almost be almost, I wouldn't say useless, but not very high on people's right. uh, uh, totem pole of things to do. But he he taught me th those things. And then my first pro job was in a Lawrence Welk style dance band mm -hmm. when I was, I think I was about 17, 18. And I did that for about three years. We, we they, it was a big band and they posted us to start with in Belfast in Northern Ireland in the middle of the Troubles. Oh boy. And then they moved us to Glasgow and I had three years in Glasgow in a, in a ballroom in Socky Hall Street. Wow. And I remember the first, the first New Year's Eve we played, they found someone's ear in one of the ex near one of the exits, the the fights and things, the shit that used to go on was unbelievable. Anyway, blah blah blah. Did that for three years, and then I left. I moved back down to London and 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 was fortunate enough to get the job with a band that I was with for a long time called Fairport Convention. Yeah, that's and the, that I was going to ask. Like yeah, so that's and and you were so you had moved back to London. Yeah, and and got the gig because you 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 didn't grow up in London though, right? You grew up. In the, out, uh, out of London, yeah, in the boondocks, relatively yeah, speaking, yeah, in the country, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so you'd moved, you moved back to London, and mm -hmm. it was not long after that that you got the gig with, and that was around 67, 68, 69. like 69. 69, 69, I got the job with Fairport, yeah. Um, I before wow. I turned pro, I used to work in a drum shop, um, in London, which was yes. kind of like the, I think you know about this, was kind of like London's equivalent of the pro drum shop in Hollywood. Yes. It was called Drum City and the world and his brother used to go in there. I, I, I met Phil Seaman and Mitch and all the, all Kenny Clare, all, all people, all heroes of mine, got to know Mitch. And, and I, when I went back to London after the dance band era in Glasgow, I went into the shop and they said, we're hanging out and blah, blah, blah. And they said, oh, have you heard of this group called Fairmont? And I went, no, aren't they one of those progressive groups? And he said, well, I don't know anything about them, but I hear they're looking for a drummer. And I didn't know anything about them at all. So I did something then, which was I thought was kind of sneaky, John, but these days, nobody would think twice about it. I went out and got the latest album, their latest yeah. album. So yeah. I took it home and I kind of learned it parrot fashion and went along to the audition a few weeks later. And there was me and about 10 other players. And for some reason, blah, blah, blah. Wow. Yeah. And, you, and, and that was it. And that, and that, I mean, you, that band only recently broke up um i they're mean it has a, they're still going really oh, yeah, they're still yeah. going yeah, yeah. They, they, they've had about at the last count i think something like about 734 lineup changes i think since uh, over <laughs> the years but they're they're still going and what's really cool about them is they one of the many things is they have a three-day music festival every year in england yeah uh, and it's a big deal i mean they they've had robert plant they've had alice cooper They've had Emmylou and Rodney. They're big. It's a big, big, and it's run by the band. So every kind of 10 or 15, 20 years, they have a big reunion. So they, they very kindly invite me to go back and join in. Yeah. The guy that took my place is a fantastic drummer, Jerry Conway. Jerry sure. took my place in Fairball. Jerry played, did all the Cat Stevens stuff. Also played with Jethro Tull. He's Jethro a great, Tull, great drummer. Sure. And, yeah. um, so they're still going. They're still going strong. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. But but you were in the band for was it 40 years? I mean, this sort of technically speaking. 69 to 74. I had 12 years off for good behavior and then did um 76, 77 for about eleven or twelve years after that. When okay. the band re reconvened and got back together. So two two main chunks but I, I should also add just for the record that after I was in Fairport the first time after I've been in the band about 
six months, this extremely very bright light bulb got switched on and it, I kind of aesthetically got them and it had an incredibly, without getting too arty farty again, John, yeah, it had an incredibly yeah. profound effect on how I heard music. Up until that point, I was all about chops, technique, speed, mm -hmm blah blah lyrics oh that's that's the that's the that's 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 the warbling stuff that the person up the front does you know i had i was purely technical 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 and they they flipped me they just completely flipped me and it, and it was and it, big big change yeah big and big it was change. and and you and it was the result of being amongst these players that you you sort of just absorbed the vibe of just being about the music and not about chops and and it it just sort of through osmosis that yes yeah you know, took that's, over that's, your mind that's the most succinct way of putting it yeah they 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 basically taught me to appreciate songs really mm -hmm. good songs and they also made me aware that having prowess is a facility is one thing but it's what you do with it yeah yeah those were the two things that I, I i i got they before i joined they were they were kind of like a covers band they were doing all west coast singer songwriter covers mm. um the then unknown joni mitchell and people they were doing these kind of obscure songs and they came to the conclusion that it was best left to the Americans to do their music and that we, Fairport, should try to come up with something that was a little bit more homegrown. And a couple of the people in the band had this love affair with English traditional music and they married that to bass drums and guitar and fiddle and blah, blah, blah. And yeah. Wow, cool. Sorry, wake up everybody. Keep coming. <laughs> Hang in there. Hang in there. No, this this is this is I'm, I'm learning so much. By the way, Skip Haddon says hello. I just oh, saw him the fantastic Skip Haddon. The fantastic Hero. Skip Haddon. The fantastically yep. Skip Haddon. Who's your neighbor just up the road there? Yeah, up in sunny yep. Gloucester. Hey Skip. Um Jerome Dupree is here, Nick Vincent, a lot of lot of familiar folks. I saw Kathleen Kelly was um uh, on a minute ago, and our friend from the Kelly Shoe Company, uh -huh. and uh, she's, I was just reading her comment. Well, anyway, hello, Kathleen, and hello, Jeff, if you're watching from the Kelly Shoe Company. Um, so I love that product, by the way. I've got about a little bit of in various space drums. It's just so cool. Me too, so cool. me too. It's, I, it's just the perfect thing. I think I think I I had had heard about it for many years, and I think it was a conversation I had with you. I and I'm not just saying this. I, I was sort of I had trepidation about like, do I want to? And uh, not in, it wasn't the financial investment, but the idea of like, do I want to mic the bass drum internally? And um, I don't like to vent the front head. I like the the closed, you know, mm -hmm. unported front head and. And I, I know I had at least one conversation with you about it and you gave it the thumbs up and you basically said something like, once you figure it out, you'll love it. It's just, you know, it's, it's indispensable basically in terms of like the ease of miking your bass drum and the sound and consistency. And I love that. I absolutely. I think it's really good. I think it's good with the front head, complete front head on or, or not, but yes, I've, I've got yeah. a kit set up with a complete front head like you and I've got the other, the other sets have got, I've got a hole, but it's just so easy. And the fact that um, the fact that the, the thing floats. Yeah, it's it's great. Yeah, it's great. Um, All right. That'll so be uh, five thousand dollars, please, Mr. <laughs> Kelly. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, Kathleen loves us both. And we love you, too. Um, so so talking about that, that epiphany that you had, mm -hmm. um, was that about the time you started working a lot in like London sessions? Was that when you started? Yeah, things I, I would imagine so. Yeah, well, I within a year of the fair, getting into Fairport, I started getting calls for a lot of folky singer songwriters, and then the big change was when Gus Dudgeon 
started calling me for sessions. Gus Dudgeon, for those who don't know, was Elton's producer. Um, he produced all the El all the Elton stuff and many other mm. people. And he started calling me for things outside of the immediate kind of folky genre. And then it kind of opened up from there. But Gus, Gus, bless him, I miss him, miss him terribly, miss him terribly. Yeah. He, he, but he, yeah, he, once Gus kind of opened that door and I started playing on non folky things as well, then things did open up. Yeah. And was this like maybe mid 70s? Yeah. Was that when that, yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, you rode that right on until I, I hate to say it like everywhere else. Mid 90s, really. Yeah. The session just scene changed yeah. everywhere, really worldwide into the mid 90s. Yeah. And, yeah. And that's, you know, I knew you'd played with Fairport, obviously. And, and I saw you on the Tull tour that you, when you came through Boston, you were nice enough to invite me. And I brought my, my best mate, Mike Mahoney, who's the world's biggest Tull fan. And uh, he still to this day remembers that we, you know, he got to meet you afterward. And um, Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I think it was at the Orpheum Theater. We did, I think we did two nights, yeah. And I remember it well, because at the sound check on the first day, a rat, the small size, about the size of a small battleship, ran across the the, the, the middle of the auditorium, and we were what the? F <laughs> and I, that's, and they said, that's "Oh, that's just my, Gus." <laughs> yeah, oh, Gus. He stole my face. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I do it, and I think um, I think Jerry Dupree came to one of those, if if memory serves. I think. Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, I know there was a there was a great thing afterwards. I think it was with Jerry. He'll probably remind me. And if it wasn't with Jerry, I apologize about going around the corner to a pub afterwards and having a adult beverage and getting into a conversation with some people. And and uh, oh, wow, the band was fantastic, wasn't it? I said, oh, well, somebody on the <laughs> <laughs> and we, were doing, we were doing one of those for about 15 yeah. minutes. I think it was with Jerry. I can't remember. Anyway, I'm sorry. Go on. No, that's okay. But I just I remember um, thinking, you know, again, a band like Tull that that one might think would be, you know, a little a little out of your comfort zone, so to speak, in terms of I, I know that I know that the band that Ian Anderson put together for that tour was a little a little left of what he, you know, the sort of normal Tull, but but you held your own so well in terms of like playing the way you play, but also, you know, with the, the kind of integrity of, of how those records were made, you know, cause there was, there were, some of them were very drummy and drumistic, you know, and, and, and so well, did, you, did you find yourself kind of going back to the woodshed to sort of get ready to, to play a gig that didn't, all of a sudden I, it was more about chops. When I, when I, Dave Pegg, who is still with Fairport, the bass player with, with, with Fairport. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and he's my link to Bonzo because he was in a band with Bonzo pre his Fairport days. Yes. And they would come and see us and we would go and see, we'd go and see Zepp and Zepp would come and see Fairport, um, which is how Sandy Denny, Fairport's second female vocalist, ended up singing on a Zepp song. But at round about, back end of the mid 80s Fairport was on a kind of hiatus and to cut another very long story short Dave Pegg ended up getting the job playing bass with Tull mm -hmm. I remember and that. Ian yeah. would start to come and check out Fairport gigs and Peggy Dave Pegg Peggy as we call him Peggy yeah and um, Peggy was was doing double duty he was playing with Fairport and he was playing with with Tull as well so Ian was coming to see Fairport and was liking it a lot and um, I get a phone call Peg calls me and says Ian's going to call you and I get a call and he said would you be interested so I said yeah all right let's have a meet so I meet and 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 I, I, again I'll try and keep this succinct I don't want people falling into a coma again no, no um, this is great he he basically I said to him look I'm really flattered that you've asked me to do this, but I really cannot do, A, I don't play double bass drum. I, I wouldn't even begin to be able to do the stuff that Clive and 
Mark Craig. I said, I can't do that. Barrymore Barlow, yeah. Oh, yeah. And Barrymore and, and Clive and all those fant- unbelievably. I said, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can play your music, but I can't do that. I can mm. I can play. I can play the music, but I can't. I can't. And he went, no, that's OK. That's OK. I, I want you to do your thing. Yeah. And what was really cool, John, was was prior to going into the, the toll thing, just the world and his brother was like, oh, 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 oh he eats drummers alive. Oh, he's going to be all over you like a rat. Oh, good luck with that. Oh, fuck it. And I'm thinking, oh, God, what have I done? And in the whole, the one year that I did with Tal, he he called me out once. We were about six gigs in and he said, you must watch me. When I do this, that means it's a blah, blah, blah. And I said, I'm sorry, I must have, I, I'm sorry I missed that cue. Mm-hmm. It, it won't happen again. And that's the only time he talked to me about any drumming. He just let me get on with it. And I think the other thing that helped me a lot was my musical relationship with Dave Pegg, because mm-hmm. we've been playing together since 69, 70. He, he, Dave Pegg joined Fairport one year after I did. So mm-hmm. we had a, and we were doing a lot of those kind of folky rock sessions, Nick Drake and John Martin and blah, 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 together. Um, so that, that helped, but that was, my thing getting into JT. I I mean, I started listening to the records and (laughs) that stuff. And as you say, I'm going, what (laughs) what have I done? What have I let myself in for here? But, but he, like I said, he, that was the only thing he said in a whole year. He said, this one, I do the blah, blah, blah. That means it's a, okay. Sorry, my bad. But it was but never, not, don't play this, don't play that. I want more of this, I want this. Yeah. And it's not to say for anybody who didn't get to see that tour, it's not to say that when you had those moments, you didn't play your ass off because you did. I mean, you just, if, you know, like you say, you don't play double bass drum, so you're, you're not going to get that sound. You're not going to get that same effect that you get when you play two bass drums, when you, you know, in those triplet-y. Mm. But but you made up for it in the in the tasty things that you played when you had those spa- you know those spots where there was whatever it was if there were eight bars to play and you uh, yeah I remember coming away going like this was I had seen Tull you know I don't know how many times before that between in the seventies with with uh, Barrymore Barlow and I saw them once with Mark Craney rest his soul oh. I saw them with Doan many times and Doan of course yeah I mean sorry yeah, I'm, Doan Perry. forgive me I'm leaving I'm leaving Doan out of this I'm yeah phenomenal but but Doan came you're... back up Doan came back after me Ian called yeah. me up and said I think I'm going to make a change I'm going to get Doan back and I went okay no. yeah and yeah. and he came back and that was the that was another learning moment John it was um, about you know the initial thing about oh is it something i've done wrong and you realize that i i learned that from armor trading when i'm playing with joan um did, did an album with her and did two or three american tours and stuff and said so when we're we doing the next album joan kind of mm-hmm. thing and she said mm-hmm. well i'm gonna i think i'm gonna go to new york and do it and i'm gonna use um i think she used richie hayward or and i went Woo! and she said she basically said dave you get to play with a lot of different people, don't you? And I went, yes. She said, I'd like to, too. <laughs> John, oh, that's great. It, it was like <laughs> a terrible, crinkly smile. And it was like, right, okay. That's hilarious. Yeah, I, I'd, li- I'd like to, too. I'd like to, too. Yeah, yeah. And oh, it was like, great. okay. Yeah, and that yeah. was another kind of, you know, bump in the learning curve about, Absolutely. If you were a freelance player, or even if Jesus these days, even if you're in a band, there's no such thing as a gig for life, you know. It's right. Just, exactly. I know. It's it's up to <clears throat> I'm gonna to say hello to my my um former neighbor, Kathy Mugazel, who lives in Situate, where I used to live. Uh-huh. In fact, you came to our house once, Dave, many years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so she's she was our neighbor two doors down. Uh, she's still there. We moved, of course. But um, she's just saying she, she she's looking at the snowfall on our beloved marsh while listening. And so 
I miss that view, Kathy. I do that miss that view. That was quite a view, John. That was a heck of a yeah. view. I remember that. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's a nice view. Yeah. We were there yesterday, in fact. had to, We haven't sold the house yet, so we were there yesterday just checking on some things. And it was just as, a, as the sun was going down about 5 o'clock yesterday afternoon, and I said to Kelly, I said, boy, this view is pretty. It's, it's just how I remember it. But anyway, we're, we're happy where we are, so... Um, that's cool. Anyway. Did, you not, did you not think about staying in that part of the world? Did you really want to move from there? Yeah, to where we, you I mean, it's just it's just one town over where we moved to, but um, we talked about it for many years, actually, about making you know this move, and we just kind of felt like it's funny. I I, I joke about this when I say this because we did it at, almost a year ago when COVID began. It was there couldn't have been a worse time to do it. So I sarcastically say. We figured we're in the middle of a pandemic. Why not move? <laughs> what, what a perfect time to, to to buy a new house and think about moving. But well, but I've got just... one one slightly parallel to that. We started a kitchen <laughs> renovation two weeks yeah. before COVID. Yeah, yeah. It only took exactly. six months. Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's just it was one of those things where we we started looking before it happened, and we uh -huh. found this place, and we loved it. And so we just sort of struck while the iron was hot and then all hell broke loose. Broke loose and, yeah. But but it all worked out fine. And, and I'm, uh, I'm pleased for you, man. I'm looking forward to, to I'm coming. I'm looking forward to coming down and, 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 and geeking out in the drum room. Can't wait. Can't wait to have you down here. Can't wait. To, we'll, we'll we'll make a day of it. We'll we'll go over and, you know, cause some trouble at Zildjian and then come back here and have a gin and tonic and cause some more trouble. So. Here's a good one for you. I don't know whether you heard this. Remember John King? Oh, yes, yes. Of course, of course. right. Yeah. So one of the first time after moving here, I went into Zildjian and I was, I was seeing you and the guys. Yeah. And John King goes, Dave, um, you're here? I said, yeah. I said, so where have you moved to? And I said, well, moved to Marblehead. And I think he looked at you or someone and he goes, uh-oh, we're going to have to limit his visits to once a year. I remember that. I remember, I remember that. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Maddox. Uh, oh, <laughs> you know, do you know the drummer Dave Stefanelli, David Stefanelli? I, I do. I you do. I know him yeah. through a, through a, a, a keyboard player called Michael Troy. Troy. Yeah. yeah Michael Troy. Sure. Yeah. 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 Well, David's an old friend, you know, he lives right. up in New Hampshire now, but an old friend from 40 years ago. And, great drummer of course and yeah. uh, and he, the first time i had him down to zildjian he was playing in this band called rtz return to zero and uh, they got signed in the early 90s and great band and so he's down to zildjian he met john for the first time and within less than five minutes he had the perfect impersonation of <laughs> of john king he's walking around going like um, David, I think I have just the crash you're looking for. Uh, I'll be right back. You know, and, and it was, and every time after that he came down, he would go, "Is uh, John King going to be uh, working with us today?" Uh, <laughs> you do. Uh, I always you, you you do a pretty good one too. <laughs> uh, well, I spent a lot of time with John. We uh, we we had a lot of fun together. So. And you do a, if I remember if memory serves, John, you do a pretty good Leonard Demuzio too. I was I just talking I was, to Therese the other day. Was she was on a second ago. Too. Oh, she was she fantastic? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, Therese, I know. And and Lenny, I know. I and Lenny was just. Uh, I was telling uh, her. I was telling her she didn't know. Um, I go to Zildjian on one of the American uh, Fairport American tours in '74, and I finally get to go to the Zildjian factory, and I'm I'm you know I'm beside myself because I'm going to get to meet these iconic people that I've been reading and hearing about for all these years. And again, long story short, Lenny, Lenny sorted me out, and and uh, it was, yeah, boy, a, pin, a pinch me moment, a pinch me. Moment. That must have been, and that would have been at the so seventy four was no, in that, well still, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was in the new, it, well, it was well, the, the current, new. it was the current location, I, the current yeah. location. I don't think they you'd been there that long, maybe of just a few years. When did the move? I think seventy. Three, I think, was right. when they moved to Norway. I think it was. So, uh, yeah. I remember somebody saying, "This is relatively new. This, this, where they are now is." Yeah, 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 yeah. But boy, talk about a, uh, you know, I mean, a, a different 
time, obviously, you know, with just Lenny. We try to tell that to the young people of today. And <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Um, I I feel so blessed to have had, you know, 14 years of of Lenny and Armin together. You know, up until we lost Armin in 2002, and, um, you know, but some of the greatest memories, like not even working at Zildjian or in music, just in my whole life, involved those two guys. You know, just like being somewhere. I I, I told this story recently. The first Pasic I ever. Uh, worked for Zildjian for. It wasn't the first one I'd gone to, but 1989, it was in Nashville. And it was my first year working at Zildjian. <clears throat> and I remember we're sitting, you know, at a, we had a big table. You had to buy this sort of, you know, big table there in the banquet, on the Friday night banquet. And um, Sandy Feldstein, I don't know if you know who Sandy was. He was a, he, he was a um, very well-known publisher in the music, in the drum business. He, he had a the- company called... Yeah, yeah, he was really a legend, and he was he was worked with the guys from from DCI Video, which you know now is Hudson Music. But he was he sort of really was the mentor for all the sort of music publishing that we know of today, all the books and stuff. So, and I'd met Sandy that I guess that year, uh-huh. so I didn't really know him well. But he was, I think, the outgoing president of PAS at the time. So he's up there giving a speech and it, you know, it's a pretty dry affair at these things. It's, it's, you know, the rubber chicken, you know, we're all just sort of there because we have to be there getting through it. And Sandy's giving this, this speech about something. And then Armin and Lenny start throwing bread rolls <laughs> on our table up to the podium where he's giving his speech and they're pelting him with bread rolls. And Sandy's going like, and he's, Sandy's laughing while he's going like, ah, you you guys cut it out, you know? And I'm sitting there going like, wow, <laughs> this is the company I work for. <laughs> These are my talk bosses. About, <laughs> yeah, talk about fun. <laughs> I didn't join in the fun. I just watched, but you know, it was just, it was hilarious. And everybody, you know, was like looking like, you know, but the, Lenny and Armin didn't even like miss a beat. They were just, you know, picking stuff up. And, yeah. The, the other Maybe thing had, that I've heard from you it. and others, Paul Francis and others, about how they would they would they would um, get involved in the uh, uh, in the adult beverages a little too early in the evening, and they halfway through a concert, it was almost guaranteed. Like, <clears throat> yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, that was you know, and and you know they earned it. Yeah, You'd, they'd be. Oh, there's Adams making a comment. <clears throat> Brothers from, from other mothers. Uh, yeah, yeah. They, they, it would be the old, like, you know, the head down, kind of like, you know. And then, the, then the last song, it ended. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, just some really funny, funny moments. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm glad that... Uh, Therese got us thinking about some of these, these yeah. funny. And, yeah. you know, I have, I have to say, I have to share. I think back to when I first met you and, and, and I actually, I think I first met you. I don't know if I should say this now because it could get you in trouble with Yamaha, but I think you came to drum workshop back in the eighties to DW up in uh, Newbury park, California and bought a snare drum. I yeah. did I, be, yeah. because John Good came to a toll gig in LA and said, "Would you be in worst effect? You know, would you be interested?" And I said, "Well, I'm really happy with Yamaha, but I, 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 you know, I, I, I'll, I'll come and I think I'll come and play a visit. And I'd love to and thank you for the invite. And I don't think at the time um, Yamaha was doing much in the way of." brass snare drums yeah it was a brass snare drum that you bought right? it yeah, was a yeah. brass snare drum i remember i remember that yeah and i think was that was that the time when we first met so that would yeah. be nine that would be 92 then i guess well was that well that was my year with toll that was the only time i just spent the whole basically oh, okay. the whole of 92 so it must well, have been 92 it was it was, was before that... 92 because i i moved really? back from la the oh, end of the yeah. i just realized what it was no you're right I was playing with Fairport and Fairport were opening for Tull. That must have been it. Okay. So yeah. that would be yeah. back end of the eighties. Yeah. That's Does what that I would sound think more like it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think I was, I, yeah, carry on. 
No, I was going to say I'd gone to Zildjian by 89, but, um, right. but you'd come up and I just said hello to you. I just, just wanted to meet you and yes. introduce myself. And you were, you were very polite and, and, and quiet and reserved. And, and I didn't want to like normal. <laughs> I didn't want to stalk you, but it was, it was a couple of years later on a visit to Zildjian in Boston. When you, when you, uh, we had lunch together. I remember we were yes. sitting there and we were, and this is a, and you know, I've, I've, I've stolen, I've plagiarized this comment many times, but I try to give you credit at, at every opportunity. And we were talking about advertising in Modern Drummer Magazine and drummers being in ads. And, and you said, this is, the, and I'll, I'll paraphrase, hopefully get close, but you said something like, well, all this business about, you know, being in ads and Modern Drummer, it's not as though Sting is th thumbing through Modern Drummer and sees Vinnie Colaiuta and says, that's the guy I want to have in my band. And that it, was, like, it was pretty it was pretty close i think i said something i said oh yes we all know that if sting or whoever is looking for a new drummer the first thing he does is pick up modern drummer and say oh i noticed finish using the new blah 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 he's obviously the right man for the job yes. <laughs> that was <laughs> and it, that, it was it was it summed it up perfectly it really did it just sort of like encapsulated the whole <laughs> the whole situation which <clears throat> Much frivolity ensued, if memory serves. Yes, exactly, yes. exactly. It's a, it's akin to the, the famous, so many drummers. So little time. So little time. <laughs> Do you know who put me straight on that? I remember having a bit of a, before I went to Evans, uh, I was with Remo and I was got fortunate, I was fortunate enough to get friends with Lloyd McCausland. Uh -huh. And I think, God, bless, God rest his soul, and his, that's what Therese, Musio and I were talking about just the other day and wonderful guy and I was talking about I think I might have been getting a bit above myself and having a bit of a moan about how come do I know and Lloyd it was Lloyd who put me straight Lloyd yeah. just said you know what's the reason you're using any any product what's the reason why are you playing so why are you playing the, I said because I I said because I really really like them and he kind of basically went Hello. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what, what do, you, do, you, do, you, do you, what do you, what do you, what's the end game here? In other words, mm -hmm. what's the end game? Are you, are you playing these things because you like the product and you appreciate the support that they give you when you need something replaced or you want to try something out or you, or are you playing them because you think you're going to get famous with other drummers? It, he really put me straight and it was another yeah. one of those, you know, yeah yeah it's that, I something mean, that you and i've talked about absolutely yep. yeah and and you know i i will say I, I i feel so fortunate to have known lloyd for a long time and and he was a you know Please. like lenny he was a mentor yeah. to to me and a lot of guys and you know jim catalano and rick drum and and some of those guys were were a little ahead of me in the business and and i looked up to those guys as as mentors and the late great steve edelson and Oh, but, you know, he was yeah, a, yeah I miss you know, him. a great guy. Yeah. And, yeah. and, but like guys like Lloyd and Lenny, you know, and, and Jim Coffin and, and, you know, that, that, yeah, yeah. The they, old they, guard. Were the, they were the lead, they were, they were kind of the leaders in that. Yeah. Film. They really yeah. were. Yeah. And I, I try to, you know, whenever I'm asked and I, and maybe I, 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 I offer this when I'm not even asked, but I try to impart some of that wisdom that I learned from these guys, which exactly what you just said, Dave, which is, you know, the, the whole, the, the whole idea of an endorsement is to play an instrument or a product that you would other otherwise go out and buy because you like it. Um, and it's just that simple, you know, it's just, it, it, it really, it's, it's so fundamental to that, that it, it involves no other sort of thinking about it. Um, it and, seems and you, to be common sense to the majority and a bit of a puzzle to a minority. Yeah. That most people seem to think that way and other people seem to think upon it as some kind of fast track to something. But as, 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 as I just said, it, you have to kind of look at, look at the bigger picture and say, okay, what's the, what's the end for one of a better cliche, what's the end game here? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, uh, this, this maybe is, it's better for you and I can, when we, finally you're able to do this have a lunch where we can uh, we're overdue to have a lunch and we can talk about this offline and not in public but it's it's one of the reasons why i just it sort of had, had enough of the business was the, the whole idea that that endorsements were the be all end all you know and i felt like i was perpetuating that you know 
almost by default because I worked, you know, in, in, a, in an industry and my job was to, you know, basically shape and, and, and drive that whole part of the business. And it, it just felt like after a while, it's like, you know what, I think, I think we're giving off the wrong message here or something. You know, I think people are getting the wrong idea of what these, and I don't know that we can fix it. <laughs> I don't know. I just, it, it just really started to. I, 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 on the, on the times when I do think about that, John, uh, to, to which you refer a uh, kind of one side of me says, it's a changed world. I mean, things change all the time, but it, you know, the, the people's players' priorities in some instances are different. And then mm. on the other, the, and that's on one shoulder and the, and the devil on the other shoulder goes, what the is going on? Yeah. And I try to, I try to find a, a, a balance between knowing that there's a lot of very, very talented people out there and work the quantity of work isn't what it used to be so everyone's kind of really and it's it's difficult and it's difficult but yeah, I, I yeah. think I, I still maintain that if you perceive that endorsement as some kind of shortcut it's yeah yeah, yeah. I, d I don't think too many too and I got into I think you and I you and I both got into this the other day John um people were saying like it was a, a thing came up on social media about, about does any does it make any difference in, anymore are we have we entered into an era where people prospective players players are already playing whether prospective players or not are they influenced by this stuff and I, I, I have absolutely no idea. I don't, I don't know whether, I'm not sure what, I'm interested to hear your take on it and other people's take or whether, whether they do find players of their, their peers, whether they're, whether they're influenced by it. Or if, if, you know, I'm a big fan of, of, of Doris Bonkers. She's just now playing the new blah, blah, blah. Oh, that means it must be good. I'll have to check that out. And I'm, I might mm. get one or, or I don't give a, I don't give a rat's, you know, I, I, I'd like to know where, well, because it was, yeah. it was definitely influential on me growing up. You know, I remember, you know, the, the obvious guy, Kenny Clare was a Ludwig guy. I watched Buddy and, you know, yeah. and the, and the rock guys. I said, oh, they said, okay, that means it, it must be, but that's, you know, that's several thousand years ago. So <laughs> <laughs> So I, same for me. Same for me. I, I mean, I, I'm, I don't know. Yeah. And we're going to save, we'll save that for a, yeah. another time when we can talk more about it. I think my, my quick answer is I think it, to some degree, it does still matter. And I think there is a level of influence, but I don't think it's near what it used to be. It used to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Tony, Tony Bronigal, one of our friends oh, and great the mighty, the mighty Tony Bronigal. Yeah, the mighty Tony Bronigal. There's says a man. There's are... a man. There's a man who knows that pockets don't just belong in a trouser factory. Yeah, he knows his way around the groove. He knows Absolutely. his way around the groove. Yeah, um, but yeah, he's saying their endorsements are not entitlements. Amen, Tony. Oh, that's true. Yeah, and and but yeah, but we'll we'll, yeah. we'll come back to that, you know, another time. But I wanted to ask you just uh, talking about the London scene during the heyday, though, like back in I, the day. <clears throat> Back in the heyday. I mean, I just think about what that must have been like with all those, you know, opportunities to play and records and, you know, like playing with Paul McCartney. And that was more like the early 80s, late or probably the late 70s, I early 80s. Can't, I, I'm on five of the records. I, I can't remember when the first ah, one okay. was. I can't remember when the first one was. Yeah. Tug of War was 81 or 82, I think, right? That was... There might have been something before that. I can't remember. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Oh, I know what the first thing was with him. He did. He did that. That's right. The first time he, I bumped into him in a music shop and he asked me about playing and he's, he'd done this thing called Rockestra where he'd yeah. got a whole bunch of drummers and bass players and kids all playing together. And, the, and there was something wrong with the audio and he wanted the audio bumped up and he got me in to try and impersonate some of the 
players can you play a little bit like this guy and then tune your drums differently and play a little bit like this? and I did that and then that that's what it was that was the first thing and then it went from oh, there anyway sorry go on yeah no, go on. no I just I, I'm just curious like what it I, I'll just use him as an example just because right. of of who he who he is and and yeah. the, the other band that he had before um, yeah. and uh, the oh, fact you, mean, he, you mean wings <laughs> wings exactly <laughs> I hadn't even thought of that, but he was in Wings too. No, I meant right. the other one, that that band from there Liverpool. There was a band he was in before Wings. <laughs> there was. Okay. They had almost as many hits. Okay. Not quite as many, but not quite as many. Um, <laughs> no, but and and knowing that he's a, a a bit of a budding drummer himself, I wonder like what it was like. And I and I, you know, I've talked with Denny Sywell a bit about this stuff too. But like when you when you worked for McCartney, did he offer input on? drum parts did he give you kind of full reign of just whatever you wanted to do or uh, i mean i'd love to see you talk to abe about this kind of stuff and he, i would imagine uh, who i'm most of us i would imagine are huge fans of i think he's oh yeah phenomenal Abe. but all the stuff that i did with him he never said boo about the drum part nothing. really nothing here it is Get on with it. I mean, once or uh, there might have been the odd. Actually, it's a bit more like kind of this kind of thing than that. Mm. Kind of, oh, okay. How about this? Yeah, yeah. Huh? Just that. It. It. it it's that. You've heard this before, and 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 most of us know this. It's that thing about having a understanding and appreciation of a player's personality and approach to their instrument and you you work with them or employ them or whatever based on what they do there isn't I think it's it it it, it, it changes when things get very complex, when you talk, when you start talking about very complex music and film scores, that's a whole different ball game. But if you're talking about down here on the ground, the level that, that I'm working at, it, basically mm -hmm. it's it, it 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 it's kind of yeah, that person. I like how that person plays. You don't. I've I've made this analogy before, and I don't mean this in a <laughs> I try not to, don't mean it to be. There's no point in. Uh, JR, did, JR did a great thing. JR Rosen did a fantastic thing. Um, I think I may have seen it on the hang he did with Neil Wilkinson and Russ Gleason. And he was talking about how he, this, this, this was a great summation. I thought, he was talking about a session he did and the guy and the guy goes oh yeah okay and when we get to the second bar i want to sing on the hi-hat there's a thing in there, and don't forget the bass drum thing it goes like that and everything when it gets to that when the feel that goes away like and jr goes hang on you're gonna love what i'm gonna do <laughs> <laughs> and i just i That's just I just, I just friggin collapsed because it's it's <laughs> like you know don't if you're gonna be that specific yeah. With all due respect, get a Berkeley student, man, and write the friggin' thing out and have him play it and then quantize it. And you're going to get what you want. Don't, yeah. you know, don't hire me to. Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I and I'm trying not to be too grandiose about that. when I when I when I say I'm not sure. I have to be me because I hate that shit. You know, I, mm. I you know, hey, I'm expressing me. I, you know, I, I'm always trying to. I'm trying to be a good accompanist. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to do, and what most of us are trying to do, is 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 play along with the music and, and, and accompany. And if there's something, if there's something, if I'm going kind of skew with and I'm 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 missing the boat, then I hope someone said, you know, Dave, I think it's it's you're a little too light or you're a little too heavy-handed or it's more this kind of a feel rather than that. And I'm probably going to go, oh, okay, how about let me try this? But when you start nailing every beat down and every kind of semi quaver unless you're playing something really really complex like yeah. some kind of industrial strength 
Chick Corea thing or a film score, then that's a different thing. But generally in the big picture about playing with other people, and it's I found it's the same as I've dipped my toes in the producer waters over the last 15, 20 years. There's no point in getting a guitar player or a bass player and either writing the entire thing out. I mean, I'm out, the chord sequence, obviously, and I might say, when it gets to the bridge, there's a phrase I'd really like you to play, just this, at this one point. That's one thing, but when you start laying everything down, it's like, well, what do you, what do you want me here for? Yeah. You yeah. know, uh, at, um, Adam Nussbaum was saying about the, the, that blues thing he's doing with, the, with the, those two guitarists. And he said, he knows, he knows the players so well and he really likes what they do. And he's just, okay, here's the music. Let, let's all get on with it. And if, and if in those situations, not, not Anna's, but an analogous to the broader picture of those, if one is hearing something one doesn't like, then it's not necessarily the the ability, not necessarily the ability of the musician, maybe just that musician isn't a good fit. Mm. And I think that's, I'm fortunate in as much as that's kind of what's happened to me. People mm -hmm. have kind of got a rough idea of where I'm at for want of a better turn of phrase and said, yeah, I think he'll be the guy to do that. And that's- yeah. I, but I, I owe so that. much of that uh, to the Fairports, John, the, the, because before then, you know, it, you know, I mean, that was me. That was me pre-Fairport. I mean, I, I, you know, I like to think it, I, I, I did the job, but I was just so enamored with technique and songs. I was like, oh, that Bob Dylan, what a terrible voice. Oh, he's missed half a bar there. What's, what on earth's going on? You know, I mean, I just yeah. had... I just had no idea, and then it was like this big light bulb went off, and I went. And then, you know, and hearing people like Paul Motion play with Charlie Hayden's Liberation Music Ensemble, that was a huge. I went, oh my goodness me, mm -hmm. that was a huge thing for me, huge thing. Wow, you don't just have to go splang splang a lang. Not that there's anything wrong with going splang splang. Yeah, splang, yeah. Splang. It's just, but that was a huge. It was a, oh god. And then you know, then then all the obvious ones, the Jim yeah. Kelms and blah blah. It, it is interesting though. I think I think most drummers probably, I, it's it's probably a normal thing to kind of start that way <clears throat> to to just. You know, and, and like you said, there's nothing wrong with that either. I mean, there are mm -hmm. plenty of guys that have found that middle ground too, to, to having all that, you know, technique, but still being so musical. But, um, but I, I, I remember as a kid practicing because I'd see Buddy Rich on TV and I just wanted to play, you know, fast single stroke roles like Buddy Rich because they sounded really cool. Unbelievably and, good. Yeah. 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 And, and I remember the first time hearing Tony Williams, I, Oh. You know, I, 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 yeah. I might have mistaken what Tony was doing for, I mean, Tony had all that stuff, but on the first and foremost, it was musical, but he could, he could pull that out of his back pocket whenever he needed to. And it was, it was right there, you know, all the. And all so the was Buddy. The That's the thing that people forget about Buddy. Yeah. If you've heard Buddy play brushes behind singer. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's Buddy for, you know, it, it's Buddy, I mean, you know, but it's, people forget that you know it's right. it, it it's that what you and I are railing against is that culture of and I'm going to come out and say it videos of just drum solos I mean I can't think of anything that I would less you know yeah yeah you know I, I want I want to give me some context mm. what's how is that how what's happened to get to that point and what's going to happen after it's 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 like it's analogous to a to a collection of clips of somebody running across the winning line of a of a race mm. yeah exactly exactly it's and I, and I can appreciate all that i mean i i 
I've listened to a lot of drum solos in my day and, and, yeah. uh, and, and to me, the, yeah, my, my favorite ones are in the context of, of, a, of a song. If it's, if it's a, if it's a, a tune where everybody's just kicking and then there's a break where the drummer gets to, to take a solo and then. Well, it's gone comes before it. Yeah. I mean, the, the, yeah. The, the, yeah, I mean, this, the, the most obvious one that, that I would imagine every single person, both of them that are watching this, that have fallen asleep, <laughs> is, I think is what, got four people. It's got four people. Is what Steve did at the end of Asia. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's just that's great. That, and, and is that a great solo by itself? Yeah. But how, it got to that point. Now you, the whole thing makes makes sense. And, yeah. and there's and there's so many others. There's there's hundreds and hundreds of others. I'm not, you know, I wouldn't like anybody to get the wrong idea. God forbid. <laughs> um, I'm not I'm not anti solo. It's just it's just. I I think. Sometimes, John, I think that. This the attempted learning of the skill of being an accompanist sometimes gets put a little bit on the back burner mm -hmm. i think that's the that's the thing uh, and the other you know, tell me what you think about this i used to think that the whole thing about what we're talking about and that approach and playing for the because you know i talk to drummers these days everybody's a song drummer you know you took oh yeah, yeah man, I'm playing for the song. So if, okay, so now we understand. Yeah. That. But I think <sighs> I'm going to let you ask another question, or if no. somebody, but I, I, otherwise I'm, I'm I'm I may go down a rabbit hole, and I'll I'll uh, I I wouldn't want um I wouldn't I, I wouldn't want people to get the wrong idea. So. <laughs> no, no, I I know exactly what you're saying, and I and I I think. You've already said it. It's it's yeah. in the context of music, um, you know. It's 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 always got to be with that in mind. It's always got to you know. Drum solos are great as long as it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's in the context of of music and yeah. I I know. I I I people send me clips of, you know, of drum solos and I'll, I'll be honest. I can't. You know, they put them in my Facebook uh, message or they'll send me a YouTube link and I just and I, maybe it's because of the job that I used to have where I. I watched a lot of drum solos for many years. I just, yeah, I, I, I'd much rather watch a great band playing, you know, and, and. Uh, you, I you know. think you can tell a lot by, yeah. I can tell, I certainly can tell a lot. I'd like to think I can tell a lot about a player when I, if I, I, I hear that player, he or she playing with a band. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what gives me some kind of context to the, to the, yeah. to the larger picture and i'm i'm nowhere near as as versed old. or old <laughs> <laughs> no i didn't mean that no but i mean in terms of of comprehending the music i'm nowhere near you with that but but it, it, even in my small mind i can appreciate like you say the the i can tell when 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 someone's playing in the context of music where they choose not to play is so important and that's that's what i base it on if i'm out even seeing like a, like when i i see you up at at uh chianti up in beverly with your band and there are many spaces where some drummers might go i've got this much room right now to, to play a fill not you you're just you're playing the time and then when you decide to play that fill it's extra special because i haven't heard it for the last five minutes <laughs> Do you, do you know what I mean, though? It's like, that's what I love about, you know, like Jeff was great about that, where, oh yeah, yeah, there were some songs where he'd, he'd play up, but there's some songs where he'd play nothing but the groove. And then when he, Tony, when Bonagle, you did do it, yeah, yeah, another guy where it's like, there's that spot, there it is. And it's like, you wait two and a half minutes for that. You, the next time you hear the song, you go, it's coming up now in about 30 more seconds, he's going to play that fill. It's going to be so great. And there it is. And then, ah, oh, you know, yeah. he might not or, hear it again. Or maybe there it isn't. And oh, there it isn't. Because yeah. I, I once described, I did a visual thing about describing what you're talking about. I did it two ways. I said, there's the, at its extreme on one side, it's like this. Mm. And on the other end, on the other end of the extreme, at the other end of the extremity, it's. Yeah. And I'd rather try to do that to people listening where they're, 
rather than than that. Yeah, yeah. The thing, the thing I was going to say, John, was that I used to think that the whole thing about getting a certain amount of gigs, stroke years, under one's belt before getting to that point of an increased awareness of economy. But what I've decided that it isn't, it isn't age specific because I know of players half of my age that are, are, are really got a great sense of, of, of the song. Yeah. And I also yeah. know players that are my age and older who are still building sheds. Yeah. So yeah. I don't think it, I, I, I used to think that you have to get to, I think it's a sensibility and I think you either, you either for better or for worse, it's not wrong. It's not right. You either you either get it or you or you don't. Yeah, I think you're right, and I think and I think maybe even, you know, I keep mentioning Jeff Picaro, but he's a, he's a guy that, you know, in his twenties had oh. that had that discipline, had that maturity and that strength yeah. or that 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 uh, ability to just know when not to play and i think it, a lot of it comes down to your environment too like where he was playing well joe is his father for a start yeah joe was his father to begin yeah. with and joe would have told you that he, that he had little to do with it which i which i would never believe but also i think it's because jeff at age 15 or 16 was playing with older musicians and and he learned quickly that you know like what no, matters yeah, it, what matters exactly? There are places to do this, and there are places not to do this. And uh, you know, and like you say, there is some of those people that come along that are just you know wise bef beyond their years he in is. terms of knowing what to do. And he, he's a he's um, a great example. Yeah, I I'm yeah. so disappointed I I never got to see him live or hear him. But but Jim told me I was very flattered. Jim did tell me that um, he'd heard of me, which I was. I'm sure he had. I I, yeah. I was that's that's from jim so i'm not going to question jim you know yeah so yeah. jim said no he did and i just so disappointed i never met him because i i same as everybody else i was listening to was jesus who's this guy you know, this is phenomenal yeah he was yeah. all over the place i mean we we were all listening to those records the same as everybody else in in england the same way you guys were over here i mean you could yeah you could miss him he was the guy I mean, yeah was, absolutely i um, talking about guys that were uh, drummers that were um, very restrained in their playing and, and never busy. I know, I know um, our mutual friend, Bob Henrit was friends with Keith Moon. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, had, did you know, I know you knew Bonzo. Did you know Keith Moon too? No. Or had you, you didn't. So you'd never no, sort of. No connection with him at all. He came in the shop once the, the drum city he came yeah, in one day okay. when i was there and it was you know i was the spotty herbert with the sticks on the practice pad behind the <laughs> behind the counter and he he, he came oh yeah oh god i remember <laughs> my boss Johnny richardson he, i was <laughs> he turned me and he went give it a rest dad <laughs> <laughs> I worked in a drum shop too. That's but what we did. Yeah. During the downtime. You... Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Every, every visiting drummers into the shop, worst nightmare, the smart ass behind the counter, he thinks. Know the door. <laughs> yeah. No, anyway. Um, no, I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't meet Keith. Um, I, the guy who used to work part time for drum city was the guy who did the Beatles logo. Yes, he did the logo, and he did he 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 did the Beatles, he did the Kinks, the Swinging Blue Jeans. That was the same guy. I I I knew him. He would come in the shop, and he do he do the mm. he do the bass drum heads. I knew him. Uh, Mitch, I got to know quite well because I remember when because when he got the gig with Georgie Fame, who I later went on to play with, and I remember him coming in one day and saying, "There's this black guy with a guitar. Man, he's good. I think I'm going to go with him." Oh yeah, sure. Later, later, you know. Wow. Six, months, six months later and ginger would come in the shop and uh uh when the, my boss was out one day and ginger came in and i got to um i got to sit down on two two kits and play play fours with ginger baker and i thought i was the mutts nuts yeah and I, 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 wow how how did that go did it did it was it 
I'm oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was fantastic, John. I held my own. <laughs> Oh, I mean, I would. I had no friggin' idea. I was yeah. sixteen. I just, I just was so enamoured working in that shop and and thinking, you know, I, I, I my boss put me in, in correctly. So put put me in put me in place a, a few times. He came in. Phil Seaman, the the the, the, oh, yeah. the great drummer who was very tight with Ginger, Kenny yeah. Clare, one of my first real drum heroes, used to come in the shop all the time. I used to pick his brains like nobody's business. Um, all that was the cool thing about it. Just like the pro drum shop in in Hollywood, um, all the all the guys came in the the the, the pop and the rock guys, the studio yeah. guys, yeah. the jazz guys. Um, I got to know Chris Caron, who was Dudley Moore's drummer. Quite oh well. yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Clem Catini drummer. probably came in. I'm yeah. Sure. Well, I'm still yeah, tight with Clem. I'm, st yeah. I'm still tight. I actually I was so proud when in the middle of my session kind of highlight period i got to do a double drum date with clem catini once it was uh, wow. it was fantastic boy did i learn something from from yeah him. but yeah. yeah clem was 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 he was yeah he was the the the, the hal blaine of london man he was yeah. he was on everything yeah i was the kind of the the you know the kind of the the, the spotty herbert following in his in his you were the jim keltner of london um the the, the, I, the one after hell i, I wouldn't jim gordon dare, dare use that name in the same sentence as myself <laughs> just because i just because i'm fortunate enough to be friends with him I, I i i wouldn't pull him down to this level let's put it that uh. way <laughs> <laughs> no i was doing i was doing all right there for a while and then of course yeah i remember who's this who's this who's this young kid simon phillips oh i don't know have you heard him no listen to this oh <laughs> I remember when Simon came on the scene. Oh my goodness me! Yeah, yeah, that was a wake up call for a lot of us. Yeah, he just texted me a minute ago too. I, it was his birthday yesterday. I sent yeah. him a text, and he just said, "You know, thanks, thanks, Johnny D." Um, but yeah, I I know Simon, and and he was. Um, I've got to do this with him too. We've we've been talking about it, but and oh, he was do. so young, right? Because he was oh. playing with his dad's band, and oh yeah, yeah, yeah. like yeah. a phenom. He, he, yeah, he's about, um, I think he's about six or seven years younger than me. But I remember when I remember when he came up and started doing sessions because I did some Phil, Phil Manzanera stuff that mm -hmm. he's on. And then I started seeing his name around town. And yeah, he was scaring, scaring the bejesus out of all of us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic know, yeah. player, man. Fantastic. Player. Fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. The whole package. Well, this has been great. I, so yeah. my, 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 Big question is: Are you going to watch the big Super Bowl game tonight? Do you you don't care about is that? There, is is there a sporting event? Or something? <laughs> there is a sporting event later. Oh, and, okay. Uh, right. it, you know, if is that, it, with the, will, is that with the round ball or the pointy ball, John? Which it's 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 the uh, sort of yeah, it's the oval shaped a pointy um, ball. Is it right? pointy pointy ball? Pointy ball. Yeah. Right. Okay. Is and that I is thought, that is that the game that's kind of like English rugby but with padding? That's the one. Yeah. Right. We, we call it American football. Okay, right. Yeah. It's remarkable. It's not not the real football, I know, but it's No, it's, it's not football as, as as we know it, but it's, as you know it's it. No, sir. And, I, and am I understanding <laughs> that there's a chap who used to be in Boston and he's not anymore and people are rather confused about it? That's right. That's right. See, I'm There's completely a lot of... on top of it, John. I mean, I <laughs> as Lenny D used to say, a lot of confusement. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, there's some confusement about it. Confusement but, uh, going on. Yeah. Well, if if our friend Tom Brady wasn't in the big game, I'd I'd be less interested. I'd still watch it, but I wouldn't be. I'm actually looking forward to it. And I I I've come to the decision that I really, really want him to win. I just I'd love to see a 43 year old man, you know, win this and, and just prove wow, that he's that old, huh? Us old guys still have That's it in like us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Keith Richards of football. That's right. That's right. Uh, well, this has been so great, Dave. Yeah, this has been so much fun. Thank you for doing this. Oh, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm, it's such such fun, man. And we we will do it again because there, you know we we obviously we go back so far. We could we could spend a whole day talking about all this stuff, and I think people would truly be interested. I'm, I don't think they're just being polite. There's been a lot of great comments, and oh, and, good, uh, yeah, good. 
And I, I'm, my very came... I'm very disappointed that no one's asked me about my stick twirling, but I, I'll, I'll get over it. Well, I, we still have time if you want to discuss your, <laughs> your stick twirling and, and, and maybe, um, well, maybe we'll save that for the next one. And you yes, can, you can I think so, John, yes. on <laughs> How to get a lot of YouTube subscribers. <laughs> that's, where, that's where I've been going wrong, John. That's, I, I, need, I need help. I need help. Uh, but, you know, I, I, um, I just, this has been so great. And, I, and I've, I've learned a lot. And I thought I knew a lot, but I've learned a lot. And, ah, yeah. Cool common sense. Yeah, lots of, lots of fun. And my friend Penny Lane, who comes to see our band all the time, um, said... Hopefully, I think she said, have Dave come to a GTA gig sometime. Well, I can tell you, Dave Maddox has played with Grand Theft Audio. I'm honored to say on a, on a I don't know if you remember the incident, but it was I my remember granddaughter's. You, why was, I can't remember the reason why you couldn't make that gig. What, what was happening? It was, it was Fiona's first birthday. Oh, this was, yeah, this was 2016 right. and my granddaughter was celebrating her first birthday. So my son and his wife, we're having a big party at the house and um so you were nice enough to sub and uh, and yeah thank you for not stealing my gig from me because i thought this is it i've it's been a great at that point i'd been in the band i think not quite two about two years and i thought well it's been a good run with this band but now i've lost the gig <laughs> you've lost the gig well i i think i think I, I think you were back in once they realized that um my 10 grand per fee per gig fee was gonna not kind of work out for them they realized Perfect. they couldn't make it. So uh, I think you're safe there, John. Yes. Thank you. Good. I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate that. The real problem, though, the real problem, John, is I, I just can't play left handed. Well, there's that, so too. Yeah, they got they got used to that. You can't be turning around and seeing a right handed drummer playing on, on your GTA gig. I mean, it's just it's not right. It confused the heck out of them. They were like, wait a minute. Yeah. Which way are we supposed to be facing? You're playing the backbeat with your left hand. What the? This is wrong. It's all wrong, John. <laughs> but they were professionals, and they rose. They 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 they, they rose above it. Good, good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> John is great, man. Thank you so oh. much for asking me to do this. I'm flattered, especially the wonderful players that you've 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 had on the Steves and the Rick Marottas and everybody else. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much, man. Oh well, well, thanks, Dave. Thank you, and and don't go away. I'm stick around in the room. I'm going to end right. the live stream, but and we'll just say goodbye off camera and you got and, it uh, all right but thanks for watching everybody big hand for dave maddox we'll do this again for sure and um i guess you know sorry to all you kansas city chiefs fans but go bucks tonight <laughs> but um thanks for watching <laughs> we'll see you soon dave don't go away <laughs>